Okay, good morning, everyone. We would like to thank you um, for joining our discussion today on respectful maternity care. Uh, my name is Allison Flynn, and I am a senior program advisor for health and nutrition at World Relief. Um, World Relief is a member of Christian Connections for International Health, um, also known as CCIH. Um, CCAH is an international network of approximately 150 Christian organizations and 20 partners, um, as well as 400 individual members. Um, about 50% of CCAH's organizational members are based in the U.S. and the other 50% um, in other countries. Uh, CCIH's mission is to promote health and wholeness from a Christian perspective. Um, and it provides opportunities for networking, sharing best practices, and advocacy. So today's webinar is sponsored by CCIH's Health of Women and Children Working Group, who have, with the support of the CCIH board, identified this issue of respectful maternity care as a key area to focus on in 2019. It's an area that directly relates to our calling as Christians to provide compassionate care, which is incidentally is this theme of our 2019 conference in June, which we would love to have you join. Um, and I'm excited to hear from our speakers today as we dig into this topic um, and hopefully walk away with some resources, examples, and next steps to consider um, in, in each of our own fields and, and work. Um, so I will introduce each speaker before they present, and we will hold all questions until the end. Um, please use the comment box that's in the upper right-hand corner of your screen um, to ask questions. So in order to input a question or comment, you'll need to use Google Chrome as your browser and be signed into a Google account. If you'd rather just email in your question, you're welcome to do so, and please send that to webinar at ccih.org. Okay, enough with logistics. Um, I'll briefly introduce our speakers and we'll hear some remarks from each of them before we open it up to an interactive dialogue and take your questions. Um, one last note, so we are recording this webinar um, and if you register, you'll get a link at the end. There will also be other ways that it'll be posted, but just um, so that you know in case you have to hop off early. Um, um, so, first today we have um, Suzanne Stalls. Um, Suzanne um, has worked throughout the world in the past 25 years in the fields of maternal, newborn, and reproductive health. Ms. Stalls is currently a senior technical advisor at JAPIGO and wow. advisor at Journal and Child Survival Program. And she's involved with program design and implementation, technical support, and domestic and global advocacy for women's health and the contributions that midwives make into the field of reproductive health. So her particular focus is on antenatal care, um, quality improvement linked with cap clinical capacity building and respectful maternity care. Um, her academic background includes an undergraduate degree in French and Spanish, um, a graduate degree in international relations and a nursing and nurse midwifery degree. Um, so during her professional career, she founded and directed a midwifery service in a large tertiary care hospital, and she practiced clinically for close to two decades. So I can't think of somebody who's uh, more experienced and you know, well-suited to share with us um, an introduction to, um, to this topic today. So I would love to just um, send it on over to, to Suzanne to begin um, and share with us. Thank you very much, Allison, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm very happy that you have um, expressed the interest in respectful uh, care. It is certainly something that I feel passionate about, and the more that we can talk about it, I feel the greater impact we'll be able to have um, throughout the world. So again, thanks very much. And as Allison said, I'm a senior technical advisor with um, the Maternal Child Survival Program, which uh, we have been fortunate enough in that our donor has been very interested in this topic. So in the past five years, we've been able to focus um, quite a bit of attention on that topic. So if you could please advance the slide. 
So our outline today, um, we'll be talking about respectful care, uh, what, what our journey to date has been, what some of the history is regarding uh, respectful care, and what are some of the key milestones. There, uh, the field is really, and I'll talk about this repeatedly, the field has just exploded in the past six to eight years. And part of what initially was really looked at was how do we re define respectful care and how do we define mistreatment and how much of this is universal based on um, human rights and dignity, how much of it is context specific. So we'll, we'll address that. And then I'd like to talk about some of the program approaches and the resources that have been used to date for respectful care work that is implemented within maternal and newborn health programs. And then lastly, where do we go from here and how can we continue to raise the visibility uh, of this topic and address effectively um, some of the disrespect and abuse that's encountered throughout the world in all settings, um, high resource settings, low resource settings. That's one of the things that we try to emphasize very clearly is that um, disrespect and abuse can be encountered anywhere, anytime, any place, and it's not specific to any one context. So if you could advance the slide, please. So here's, I, I, this actually is a, quite a bit, it's a long laundry list, so I'm not going to um, go over each and every topic, but you can see that our starting point really was um, the 1947 UN Declaration of um, Human Rights uh, that are applicable universally. And then, uh, you know, beginning in the 1980s is really when there was a focus in development work on um, maternal well being, uh, maternal morbidity and mortality, both in um, the course of a woman's reproductive life. And so with that emphasis, there was, uh, you know, the primary focus was what do we need to do to save someone's life? And, uh, and that continues to be one of the primary focus as, as well. But one of the things that started emerging in the 90s was a recognition that um, not only were clinical interventions that uh, were quality clinical interventions, were, not only were they needed, but uh, quality of care in terms of respect uh, was needed. So in the um, Latin American and Caribbean region, there emerged a movement called humanization of childbirth. Uh, the UN had a declaration of elimination of violence against women. And then in the early 2000s, some anecdotal reports began to emerge that, um, that disrespect and abuse that occurred in facilities were seen by women and by communities as significant deterrence to uh, access to care. And in 2010, um, at Bowser and Hill, and, and it, this is easily found if you Google it. And I feel very fortunate to say that Kathleen Hill, one of the authors is um, my dear colleague here, and she's been instrumental in advancing this topic. But it was an initial landscape analysis just to understand, you know, what what form does mistreatment take? What What is the prevalence? How do we look at this? And then USAID began funding implementation research projects. And then very importantly, the White Ribbon Alliance um, developed a respectful chart, a respectful maternity care charter based on the universal rights of childbearing women. Next slide, please. So, and here's uh, the example of the charter. And again, this is something that can easily be found online. And I, I think the charters you know, the huge impact and importance has to do with being able to just spell out what specifically is um, respectful care and what is that definition. Next slide, please. And here are, here are the things that have occurred just in the last five years. And, and as I said, this field is moving very, very rapidly. And there's been an increased attention, um, particularly from the World Health Organization uh, with their quality of care framework. Um, the UN 
mounted the initiative of Every Woman, Every Child. Uh, with the quality of care framework, WHO has developed standards and measures so that we actually have the ability to measure quality of care and um, understand how to measure um, what respectful care looks like, which is a huge challenge because as clinicians, we're oftentimes accustomed to measuring things that are very quantifiable. And in this case, um, you know, there still remains to be work to understand how precisely we can reflect um, either respectful care when it occurs or disrespectful care. And this last bullet point um, talks about defining disrespect and abuse of newborns. And this is something again that has come to the forefront. And what one of the things that we're currently engaged with is um, with the White Ribbon Alliance, we are rewriting the respectful maternity care charter to include both women and newborns. Next slide, please. This was a, a, a huge um, statement or declaration published by World Health Organization. And that was really a call to um, action in terms of looking at how we can prevent and eliminate disrespect and abuse in facility-based childbirth. Next slide, please. And this is the quality of care framework that WHO published in 2015. And uh, in, in the world that, that we move in of, um, you know, of trying to understand better, you know, how we achieve goals for uh, better care for women and, and infants, this particular framework it really represents uh, a fairly revolutionary perspective in that for the first time, quality of care was defined as not only provision of clinical care that is of high quality, but that also the experience of care, the experience of care um, by women and of the, you know by their families, was of um, significant importance as well. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of uh, how, at least WHO has come to define um, some of these measures of respect and. The, the standard five, which uh, belongs back in that the diagram that we looked at um, in the experience of care and standard five is uh, states that women and newborns receive care with respect and with dignity. And then the quality statements are a means of understanding whether or not we are able to achieve that standard. Next slide, please. So the last, um, you know, well, I shouldn't say the last, but a, a, another instrumental study um, conducted by World Health Organization 2015, which actually began to define types of mistreatment. So again, that we could understand better when they occurred, where they occurred, to what extent they occurred. And as you can see, it's um, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, stigma and discrimination, um, based on socioeconomic status or ethnicity, a failure to meet professional standards of care, uh, poor rapport, and again, the, there's a, quite a bit of emphasis on communication between women and providers, and then lastly, health system conditions and constraints. And what I often tell people when they ask me about um, the work of respectful care is that I do this as much for the women and families as I do for the providers. And my colleagues around the world work in very, very uh, challenging, stressful situations that, um, you know, have the capacity to discourage anyone. And so uh, my hope is that not only can we support women and infants to have the experience that they want to need, but that providers are able to um, give the care that they would like to give. So what we know about um, mistreatment is that women are particularly vulnerable during childbirth. Um, we know that it likely has direct impact on uh, mothers and infants and inhibits both their ability and willingness to use services. Next slide, please. 
And uh, in terms of, you know, now that we've laid the foundation in terms of research and uh, evidence, well, and some evidence, um, now we are beginning to think about how do we move from this point to program implementation. So as we said, there's been this explosion of interest and evidence. There's been close to 200 publications since 2010 alone. And now that we have this body of research and analysis, um, a, a number of programming approaches have been um, utilized. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And we need to understand at this point, what are the mechanisms for integrating respectful care into maternal newborn health programs? And as um, MCSP, the project um, with which I'm affiliated, we identified a need to um, support moving evidence into action. And we have developed something that's called the Respectful Maternity Care Operational Guidance. Next slide, please. So uh, the purpose of that guidance was to provide country stakeholders with a process to guide design, implementation, and monitoring of efforts to strengthen respectful care. And one of the things that we noticed as this field began to move um, from acquiring evidence into action was that um, people were looking at this as a, as a checklist, so to speak. Well, if we put up curtains in the labor room or if we permit companions, um, therefore we have uh, respectful care. And what we'd really like to encourage people to think about and evaluate is why does it this occur in your setting and um, how do we look at that and understand and from there co-design a process to help address these issues with the community and the facility itself. Next slide please. So this is um, our operational guidance. It is available on, on the MCSP website. We're finalizing this. The, the MCSP is closing out in the next six months and so we're we're finalizing all of our documents um, for uh, distribution. These, the, the resources that I've listed here that are called Staha and Hashima, those are the two implementation research projects that uh, USAID funded in 2011. They concluded about two years ago that they have um, huge resources. Uh, and I would encourage anybody interested in programming um, to look at those resources as well. Next slide, please. So in putting together this operational guidance, we had a few guiding principles. Uh, as I said, there's a strong emphasis on process, given the psychosocial, cultural, gender, economic drivers of disrespect and abuse, the responses are by definition or should be context specific. And we're also talking about an intact system, um, the multiple levels of the healthcare system, and in truth, uh, disrespect and abuse is pervasive throughout. As I mentioned earlier, when talking about uh, what happens for providers in those settings as well. Next slide, please. Um, and we um, place significant emphasis both on providers and recipients of care, uh, although much of the initial work focused on women's perception, but in truth, mistreatment represents a breakdown in accountability of the entire system. And professional ideals often falter in the face of just almost insurmountable obstacles in those settings. Next slide, please. So these are just some additional um, streams of work that are taking place in respectful care. And there's a significant amount of advocacy going on through the Global Respectful Care Council, through um, WHO and working groups that they have. Um, research and metrics, uh, people are continually looking at what are some of the assessments on a qualitative basis in a particular context, and then also looking at defining and measuring mistreatment. Uh, lots of policy work is happening in terms of um, countries instituting national respectful care policies. Any number of governments, civil society, faith-based organizations, partners, USAID are beginning to implement 
and there are global frameworks with the quality of care framework and then earlier we spoke about um, the human rights approach as well. So lastly, where do we go from here? And um, there are, you know, as we're learning more and more, we're understanding more and more of what needs to be done. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are really beginning to look more closely at the newborn and the mother baby dyad um, so that we can support both the dyad and then the newborn as the individual being that a newborn is. And looking deeply at, at local understanding, um, advocacy, continued country implementation metrics, and also looking at how we can expand our partnerships. So that is the conclusion of um, my presentation, and I look forward to responding to your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that uh, really wonderful presentation. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone at this moment that if you want, if you have any questions um, from what Suzanne shared, you're welcome to write those into the chat box. It's on the right. Um, and so uh, now we're going to go ahead and hear from um, Dr. Jean Chamberlain Froze. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chamberlain is an internationally recognized expert in women's health. She's a qualified obstetri obstetrician and gynecologist, and she is a member of the Order um, of Canada. Um, she's volunteered in some of the world's poorest countries to make childbirth a safer experience. Um, she's the founder and executive director of Save the Mothers, an organization that is dedicated to saving some of the 287,000 women who die in childbirth every year. Prior to establishing Save the Mothers, Dr. Chamberlain worked as an obstetrician in Yemen, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Pakistan, where she was confronted with the tragedy of mothers dying from preventable causes. And in 2009, she was awarded the Teasdale Corti Humanitarian Award, which is a prestigious national award um, by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada for her work in improving maternal health around the world. So we're really honored to hear from Dr. Chamberlain today, and I'm going to pass it over to her. Great. Well, thanks very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I just should make one quick uh, adjustment there that I'm the uh, founding director of Save the Mothers, but no longer the executive director. I'm back to uh, uh, being an advocate on uh, uh, the other side of the ocean for mothers and encouraging people to become uh, uh, in safe motherhood. So, and I'm a full-time uh, professor at uh, McMaster where I teach medical students and do my favorite thing, which is delivering babies. So. Uh, I just wanted to uh, share some slides with you here now. Um, I'm having a little bit of dif difficulty um, with the screen share, so maybe you're going to have to pull up my slides if you don't mind, and I'll have to do the, because uh, it seems to be uh, doing that. Can somebody help me with that? Jean, yes. Sorry about that. We'll we'll pull them up yeah. for you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm not sure why the, the screen share was working a minute ago, but... Uh, that's how it works in obstetrics and gynecology. Sometimes you just have to come up with a new plan. So there we go. Uh, see if it will do it now. There we go. Super. Okay, super. So I just want to spend a few minutes um, just talking with you a little bit about um, the this this whole issue, of course, of uh, uh, respectful care and and maybe sort of uh, honing down a little bit closer in on um, uh, one particular example. Next, please. Uh, just by way of background, I want to explain what Save the Mothers is. Uh, Save the Mothers is an organization uh, developing uh, Indigenous leaders for change, but they're multidisciplinary. They're mostly not health workers. Some of them are uh, to really address the three delays of uh, maternal mortality. And there's now been 450 people that have been in the program, East Africans who've taken the program and are now uh, leaders for change uh, in, in that area. Next, please. 
Next, please, Yannis. Um, so just by way of background, of course, this is something that we all know already, but to the high rate of uh, newborn and uh, maternal mortality in East Africa and many parts around the world has really become uh, an issue of international concern. And it was interesting, I uh, graduated as an obstetrician in 1996, a long, long time ago now, and that was just I, there's just a time when, again, the world was starting to pay uh, more attention to this. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, the numbers are still significant. They were higher than 585,000 mothers dying. Uh, but I look at uh, Uganda, a country where I lived for 12 years with my family, and there's 6,000 mothers dying every year from pregnancy-related complications. When meanwhile, in a country like Canada, where I currently live, you know, we maybe lose about 20 mothers a year. So uh, same population. Uh, so that's a huge difference. Uh, so the problem is great. That's the what. Next week. Um, but when we look at the, the why, of course, we know the three delays of uh, maternal mortality. The first delay in, in decision to seek care, the second to actually get to care, and then finally uh, the, um, the delay at the healthcare facilities. But if you look at what's happening at those first and second uh, delays, it's often an issue of a poor relationship between the health facilities and the community. And of course, when we think of the community, who is the community? The community is the mothers and the people that are surrounding their families, their partners, um, the people who, who uh, they're part of um, a larger community. So uh, when we think of the first two delays, there's definitely that weak relationship, which again, responds and it reflects uh, the trust even that uh, people have in the healthcare facility out in the community. And then of course, there's a third delay, which is the fragile healthcare system in many places and again having worked in many of these countries in many situations like this again just you know coming to work and realizing we don't have enough equipment or the people that we need are not here today to help uh, again all of these things are contributing to um, maternal death and disability uh, and of course uh, the same for neonates as well too and let's not forget the the women who suffer uh, permanent disability as a result of unsafe motherhood. I'll never forget taking this picture of this woman in northern Uganda, and there she is carrying this bucket for the rest of her life because, again, she has a uh, fistula caused by unsafe motherhood. These fistulas don't happen in other um, uh, developed countries around the world or, or global um, uh, north countries. Next, please. So the solution, do we have it? Next. Next, please. Uh, yes, we do have the solutions. All the basic tools that are available to save a mother's and usually a newborn's uh, life as well too are there. Antibiotics uh, to deal with infections, antihypertensives, uh, medications to help mothers who have high blood pressure, a major killer of women. Uh, tocolytics, that means um, to, to stop um, bleeding. Um, again, those things are all available and there's more and more medications actually being um, um, uh, developed as well too. We can remove placentas, that's quite easy as well too. Just recently had one myself and you realize that actually saves a woman's life and it's a very simple thing. But if a woman doesn't receive the medication that she needs, um, she can end up dying. And then of course, operative deliveries, which again are a little higher level, uh, having someone who can actually do either a vacuum delivery or a cesarean section, again, requires a higher level of um, person. But in terms of training, but again, all of these things um, are very doable and they can be uh, available uh, to women all over the world, not just women that um, are fortunate enough to be uh, very close to healthcare facility next week. Next, yeah, thanks. So the gap is, we know what the solution is, the care that's required, but the challenge is, how do we get the provision of care to all women that need it? In other words, that's how to save the lives is we get rid of this gap between we know the care is available, but how do we actually make sure that every woman can access it and feels like she should access it as well? Next. So I, I uh, joke jokingly say this, but it's true. Women vote with their feet. Let me explain what I mean by that next. Care can be available, but women don't necessarily come. And, you know, I look at this uh, operating room and I just sort of think to myself, would I ever want to go in there or send one of my loved ones into that uh, environment in order to get uh, care? Uh, there's sometimes very simple things that can be done to ensure that it's a more welcoming environment uh, for women. And again, this comes back to respect. That people feel respected when the environment that they're in is is um, more welcoming and also the healthcare workers themselves also feel uh, better about uh, themselves as well too. Next please. 
So why don't women come uh, to the healthcare facilities? And there's really two issues. There's fear and then there's stories. And uh, stories really relate to quality of care. They've heard a story from somebody else and it doesn't matter where you uh, look after women, whether you're in the, the fanciest the facility or in the non-fancies, women always come in with their own stories, their own sisters, their own mothers, somebody, their aunties have told them stories about what happened to them when they were pregnant or what happened to them when they went to that healthcare facility. So people come in with stories and it changes the way they view things. Next. So what are they afraid of? Well, they're often afraid of mistreatment or being misunderstood. And uh, as Suzanne has capably told us and shared with us, that is a very real fear uh, in many situations. And I just want to say that it's, again, not only restricted to uh, uh, Global South countries, but also in the, in the North as well, too. I know even here at my own hospital, this even recently, we've been talking about this more and more, how to ensure that women feel respected in their um, uh, in, in a very vulnerable moment in their lives. They're delivering a baby. People are seeing parts of them that nobody else has seen before. People are, women are really afraid and so they're naturally afraid um, of uh, being mistreated or being abused and unfortunately many times uh, as Suzanne shared um, those things are, are uh, very real. Um, so they're also wondering am I going to get the care that I need next. So how do we address these? Well a safe and a dignified delivery. And we can do both. Yes, we can have a safe delivery where women get the care that they need, but they also have a dignified delivery. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Next. I'm going to keep moving a little bit quicker so who's ever changing slides. So think about the latest restaurant experience that you've had. Next. When you went into that restaurant, what were you experiencing? And sorry to be using such a, a simple example, but I just want to help us to think about how women, when they come to a healthcare facility, are also viewing it. When we went to that restaurant, we were expecting that the quality of the food was going to be there, that it wasn't going to be laid with bacteria, that the, the, the food would be available, everything would be available that we need. Women don't choose what complication they're going to have a pregnancy. If they have an infection, they need antibiotics. If they have obstructed labor, they need a cesarean section. So the products need to be available. The service needs to be there with a smile. If you, you want a courteous person who's looking after you, and if you go into a restaurant and are mistreated, it doesn't matter where you are. And I've been at some of the, the uh, most remotest um, restaurants that are there with a simple chair and almost nothing there. But it's, it's how people treat you also makes a big, big difference. Uh, even if the food isn't great, uh, the server is kind. And obviously, clean environment too as well. Next. Next. Oh, there we go, super. So again, Suzanne has really given us a summary of the issues and sort of the history of respectful care and has talked a lot about the program approaches. But I wanted just for the last couple of minutes, just look at one example of a program approach uh, that has been shown to be effective uh, and, and particularly optimizing human resources. You know, when we talk about disrespectful care, who is it that's giving disrespectful care? It's not the environment, it's not the, the, the building itself, it's actually people. And so we really need to be care focusing on people, caring for people, and doing that in a respectful way. Next. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the Mother Baby Friendly Hospital uh, program, and it's really 10 steps. to improve safe and newborn care. Next, please. So mm -hmm. it's a 10-step 10 10 multidisciplinary approach. So we get people who are not necessarily medical, so social scientists, religious leaders, uh, people of influence who have been involved with the um, Masters of Public Health Leadership Program that I was telling you about earlier, training uh, Indigenous leaders who, who participate in this program and help to be mentors to people uh, in the hospital. So it's people even outside the hospital uh, becoming involved. And I'm not saying that every place is going to have this sort of program, but I think it calls out to the fact that there's people in the community that want to see the hospital uh, improve. They want to see the healthcare facility improve and give uh, respectful care. So we really need to have that liaison with the, with the community and hearing what they have to say. We're now in 10 hospitals across Uganda. Next, please. And there's 10 steps. The first, again, of course, is respectful and dignified care. And as Suzanne mentioned, things like adding curtains, these sort of simple things um, are, are very, very important. Um, but it's also more than that. It is also about connecting with and training uh, the healthcare workers, the, the midwives, the doctors, about how to give that kind of respectful care, making sure that they get the care that they needed in terms of treatment. Because again, 
you know, in my opinion, as a healthcare professional, one a person is not being respected and uh, treated properly if they aren't getting the actual uh, medication or care that they need. If they come in and they need an antibiotic and it's not there, um, you know, you can be very nice to that woman, but if she doesn't get the antibiotic that she needs, uh, then she's not being respected either in terms of the, the, um, the particular need that she has. So it's this balance of making sure, yes, that we uh, provide the services uh, that, and those things are actually available, but then also we do that in a respectful way. We need to have communication with the community. And again, that's respecting the community. It's bringing the community in. Um, and, and that's what we've done with the Mother Baby Friendly Hospital. Hospitals actually have um, open house days where uh, people from the community come in and see what's going on, uh, where they connect, where they go out uh, with various ways of reaching out to the community and letting them know that this is a place where mothers can come. Because oftentimes hospitals and healthcare facilities are seen as having a big wall there and nobody can come in here unless you're actually in labor. Um, and so again, it's just really important that the local leaders come in, see the facilities, they understand what's going on. Sometimes they have resources and ways of being able to help other uh, facilities as well too. Uh, making sure that we're documenting. These things are very important. It's all part of respect. Protocols are in place and uh, so the woman has a postpartum hemorrhage. She's treated in a certain way, it doesn't matter who she is, uh, and those protocols are being followed. And that again is a way of ensuring quality of care and uh, ensuring respect. Next please. Um, the, the next couple of uh, uh, points are also very important, again, about ensuring that we're also motivating our healthcare workers. Because again, no healthcare worker wants to come in and abuse patients, but sometimes they don't even realize how they're coming across, or maybe they're so discouraged with the work that they're doing, they sort of feel like nobody actually really cares. So it's important, again, that we motivate the healthcare workers and make them really feel proud, as uh, Suzanne mentioned, about the work that they're doing. Um, and that really goes a long, long way to um, making sure that women, no matter when they come in, are being treated in a respectful way. Having feedback from the community and feedback from families, uh, questionnaires, those sorts of things, let us sometimes hear what people are saying about the services that we're providing. That's sometimes difficult. I know as a, a doctor myself, I don't always want to hear when a patient isn't happy about our interaction, but you know, that's so important for me uh, to, to actually improve the services that I'm giving and also my relationship with that uh, particular individual. Um, having a functional referral system, so we've used um, uh, phone in lines, uh, communication systems, so people can phone in. Again, it just shows respect. We wanna hear from you, uh, phone in. If you've got a problem, we're happy to help you, tell you what you need to do. Maybe it's to come in the hospital, maybe it's to do something else. So we've had these toll free lines that have actually been really successful um, in improving how women feel treated uh, in the hospital. And we've got more information about that in a short period of time. I can't go through all of that, but it's been a very effective um, way for the community to feel connected uh, with the healthcare facilities. Uh, we are here to the mother, sorry, to the baby friendly um, hospital initiative, encouraging breastfeeding, of course, as well too. And then ongoing certification, because you know what, we can try and bring standards up to a certain level uh, but we all need to continue to be certified. And I know even my hospital here at St. Joseph's Hospital in Canada, we are part of the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. And every time they come around to evaluate us, uh, you know, things, the, the, the levels go up in terms of, um, of uh, adherence uh, because of that. So certification is important. Next, please. So I just want to just quickly show you, and we're going to really zoom through these. Um, uh, we'll go to the next one, please. Uh, through just some of the examples of what this looks like. Next, please. <clears throat> Uh, some of the things that um, midwifery mentorships, this has been so important, having someone come in uh, for a couple of weeks, work with the midwives in these health facilities, showing them how to do things in, in a way that's more mother baby friendly hospital um, that really encourages um, um, respect for women and just it, really modeling the example. Because again, you can go to a workshop and learn these things, but when you have somebody there beside you, it's so much more effective. And again, each one of these things uh, relate to some of the steps, these 10 steps that I talked about. Again, the toll-free lines have to do with step eight, improving water management, it has to do with step uh, two, uh, working with leadership again, having to do with step one. Next, please. <clears throat> um, mentorships, uh, again, for neonatal resuscitation, use of partographs. Uh, again, we use these advisors from the, mother, from the uh, Masters of Public Health Leadership Program to come in and help the hospitals as well too. 
Uh, just simple things that sometimes be bottlenecks, even for the healthcare workers themselves, not even be able to have the tea. If you've stayed up all night delivering babies, you know how tired you can be. Just have a little cup of tea at five o'clock in the morning to help you through. So these little bottlenecks that really make a difference for the healthcare workers. When you have a health, happy healthcare worker, you have a lot more chance of having um, a better interaction and respectful care for, uh, for mothers. Next, please. Um, again, I just want to emphasize how much, how important it is for attitudes and, and professional behavior to be changed through these types of mentoring. It's, it's, it, we know this about education. We're not reinventing the wheel. We just need to do what we already know. Next, please. Uh, one last thing I just want to quickly talk about is the high dependency units, which is basically kind of like an intensive care unit for uh, really sick mothers. This has been a really effective way again of ensuring that women get uh, the care that they need the appropriate care but also in a respectful way that they're not just sort of thrown in with all the other mothers but if they've got a really bad complication they're there getting uh, focused and quality care which again has a lot to do with respect that they're getting next please so just as i conclude this uh, mother baby friendly hospital is a comprehensive and gradable package it's multidisciplinary. It's not about only healthcare workers. It's about others getting involved, social workers who can help us actually uh, communicate better and to work with what is actually there. I think it's very unreasonable to assume that we're going to put millions and millions and millions of dollars in these. No, we've got the equipment now. We have got the people. What we all we need to really do is refocus our energies in a way um, that helps them be able to deliver the, the care in, in, um, in a way that is really respectful but that is also very very effective and again prioritizing a safe and a dignified delivery. I don't think you can have one uh, without the other. Next please. So I want to thank you. If any of you have any further questions after this webinar feel free to contact uh, um, Dr. Uh, Miriam Mudabazi, Deborah Mense, or Dr. Eve Nakabembe. I certainly want to thank them and the entire Save the Mothers team uh, for the great work that they've been doing for the Mother Baby Friend Hospital. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chamberlain, for um, that really informative presentation. Um, and yeah, that's uh, it, it's really um, lovely to to hear about all this. And I'm I am sure there's lots of questions that are going to be coming in about this and about Suzanne's presentations. So I will just um, give everyone a reminder that if you have a question, you're welcome to um, put that over in the chat box and we will um, get through them. And so uh, we are going to start off um, with a question that is for, G or for Dr. Chamberlain. Um, so this person asks, um, how does a toll-free line work in countries where people are paying for mobile minutes um, and data on scratch cards. Right, well, um, I, I don't know all of the details about all the different types of mobile um, uh, phones that are available, but the way we were able to do it in Uganda was, is that uh, we actually paid um, from the program's point of view. So anytime someone um, phoned in, they, were, they weren't being charged uh, for the phone call. It was only being charged from our end. So um, I'm sure there's differences within countries, even here in Canada, when you phone out, you actually get charged versus in Uganda, it was only the receiving call uh, that, that had to charge. So that would be a problem actually. Uh, having said that, toll-free lines are supposed to be that very thing, is that you're not supposed to be being charged. So I think you have to connect with your uh, telecom uh, company. And But I think again, trying to, and this is what we try to do even in Uganda, was work with these telecom um, com com companies uh, really remind them their importance of, of them being engaged in safe motherhood in their own country and this is a way that they could actually provide um, services by actually having a, a free uh, telephone line for people to phone in but the, the phone actually stays in the labor area the labor room it's a it's not a mobile phone it's actually a, a permanent line so that it doesn't pick up and leave and um, and then it's available so that when people call in then um, the midwives or who's ever in labor delivery at that time can can answer it but again I'm not saying it takes away all of the problems but it definitely allows people to feel connected you know we had situations where we were able to phone one of the other hospitals and get blood and get it to the appropriate hospital another one where we able to organize uh, transportation as well too that's the other thing that the hospital can do as well with the healthcare facilities help to help the uh, mother get the transportation that she needs as well too. So these are simple things that we use 
every single day. And I think sometimes we get these compartments of, well, that's not part of the healthcare system, but actually telecommunications is, and we need to be able to use that as effectively as we can. But you just have to figure out how does it work in your particular um, environment. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we have another question um, for Suzanne. Uh, this person asks, um, is respectful maternity care addressing only facility-based um, programming, I suppose? They say, uh, related to the question, so the experience in, in Jomked, India, showed that prenatal delivery, postnatal, and postnatal care for low-risk pregnancies, which were up to 85% of them, um, by community health workers was very effective um, and much better than institutional care, and also the continuity of care through pregnancy to the postnatal period. Uh, the emphasis on facility-based deliveries for all can be part of the problem. In India, when the policy was promoted, the facilities weren't prepared. Um, so that would be the policy in India where uh, women were, uh, were the government provided them um, support to access hospitals for, um, for delivery. So Suzanne, does that question make sense? <laughs> well, it, it, um, it's actually, a, it's a question that, and a debate that has um, been going on now for over 25 years and it uh, really began in the early 90s with a publication by Deborah Main at Columbia when she suggested that all, um, you know, births should take place in facilities. And at that point, the larger proportion of births throughout the world took place at home. And, you know, I don't know that um, that debate is ever going to necessarily be completely uh, settled. I think that for one thing, uh, there are countries that have decided that um, through policy and incentives such as India that births uh, are going to take place in the facilities. And so, you know, from my perspective as a nurse midwife and as a person who has supported implementation for decades, you know, once the, the ministry makes that kind of decision, then our role is to support the quality of the implementation. And you know, I think, you know, there's all sorts of ways that you can kind of slice this bread. And um, one of the, you know, one of the challenges in a lower resource setting is when you say low risk pregnancy, you know, what does that look like actually in that kind of setting? I mean, in India, over 50% of the children are stunted. So by definition, that means that you have a pretty significant population of women who are giving birth, who are stunted, who just a priori have higher risk of complications um, during birth. And then, you know, the flip side of that coin is when you drive that number of people into a facility that is under-resourced, uh, you uh, are not necessarily going to receive quality care. And in fact, one of the things that India is wrestling with right now is their institutional delivery rate is now, I think, right around 80 percent and but their maternal mortality has not uh, dropped concomitantly which tells us that the quality of the care that is received in um, those settings is not what it could be or should be so I you know I like I said this is a, a complex question and um, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that the answer is community-based um, deliveries that take place outside of a setting, um, you know, where there is an emergency response. And in fact, that is not, you know, the other piece of it is it is not the stance of many, many countries. Um, so I, you know, from my perspective, I, uh, you know, the efforts are or not from my perspective, but from my organization's perspective, the efforts are are placed um, in supporting the the institutions to deliver higher quality care. That's not. There's no answer to yeah. your question. <laughs> it's a debate. <laughs> but I just let me uh, piggyback on what Suzanne's saying. I mean, the 
reality is we only have uh, so many, there's a expression about red Smarties, they're these little chocolate uh, um, candies that you eat, and the red ones are kind of the special ones, and when do you eat your red Smarties, you eat them at the end, or you eat them at the beginning, I mean, you've got, you only have so many special red Smarties, and I think um, you're right, we have to to then make a decision are we going to ensure that all the healthcare facilities um, are to a certain par or if women are delivering at home how are you going to make sure that every sing every single home delivery um, is is safe and again those can be certainly challenges with uh, with distance so I think there's some sometimes hard decisions that are being that need to be made but I think we have to persist and we have to continue to make small uh, bites because you know no place changes quickly I mean Again, I've worked all over the world and then I come back to Canada and I see how long it takes for things to change here in North America and you sort of scratch your head and sort of say, like, isn't that obvious? So I think, again, it's it's biting away at it and ensuring that you're seeing the quality changes that, you, that need to be there. Thank you so much for um, for those thoughts. I think that, that actually brings up... Um, you know, I, I think we can kind of maybe even continue on with that thought. I so I live in Malawi, where it is um, it is policy and required that women give birth in a facility. Um, but still, there is. I think both of you talked a little bit about um, about how the community needs to be involved in that as well. So I'd love to just hear um, you have some thoughts about um, about ways to um, to involve the community or if people are maybe not even necessarily working inside of the facility, but only in, only in the community, what are some, um, is, uh, maybe are there some interesting things that you've seen or, um, or thoughts or best practices that you would share with how to engage the community in um, trying to improve respectful care? Go ahead, Suzanne. Uh, well, in regards to Malawi, I actually worked in Malawi a lot, and um, one of the uh, there are a couple of really fabulous examples of things that have been done there. And one of them was a project that was implemented by a IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and they essentially created um, community-based that were jointly constructed with facility-based quality improvement committees and created uh, dashboards and scorecards for looking at the issues that they felt were the highest priority, both from the perspective of the community and the facility. And I just got back from Guatemala where we had, um, as another example, where we had conducted formative assessments in both communities with the traditional birth attendants and the providers in the facility and the administrators of the facility to look at what they felt like were um, the types of mistreatment that occurred and um, also you know, why they thought this mistreatment occurred. And then we disseminated the results in public meetings and then held a joint, um, what we call a co-design process between the community and the facility to look at what are some of the initiatives or the activities that we could put into place that will help you know, decrease um, disrespect and promote respectful care. And a lot of this is, the way that we wrote our um, operational guidance. So you can look at that online and and it, it's a it like I said that it's a it's a process based um, guidance. It is not does not say go in and do this and do this and do this and do that in terms of like items that would um, we we really encourage people to understand from the facility standpoint and the community standpoint what um, are the problems and what are what is their perspective on responding to those problems? Thanks, Suzanne. I, I totally agree with you. It's it's not a cookbook sort of um, here are the 10 steps that you need to do to get rid of disrespectful care. It really is about encouraging communication. And you all know when people communicate better, like just things go away. And we think about the healthcare facilities. Who was in the healthcare facilities? I mean, they're people and they're people who live in the community. So, you know, somehow they, 
there shouldn't be this change when they walk in through the doors of the of the um, hospital or healthcare facility that they also start treating diff people differently. I mean, they would never do, they would never disrespect somebody out in the community without sort of being called up on it. So I think, again, the more communication that can be there, I think, again, just as Dan said, having these public meetings where you bring people to the hospital, to the healthcare facility is so important to talk about these things. And you know, don't start on a negative, you don't want to talk about disrespect in the healthcare facility, but just sort of talk about what's going on uh, in the health, how many deliveries that we had, and you know, lives saved, all those kind of like present a positive um, uh, uh, message, but then also start to drill down on sort of how can we improve and hear from the community what those things are. And then as the healthcare workers see that they, they or hear that, then you know, it helps them sort of think, well, maybe I would handle uh, this particular situation differently. I think the other important thing too is on the leadership of the healthcare facility is to make sure that there are um, community representatives there because those people are so important uh, to, to continue that dialogue and it keeps the hospital uh, accountable as well. So again, nobody intentionally or very few intentionally uh, disrespect women, but it's more things just sort of slide easily. And that's why we, we need, uh, just, again, these, these healthcare workers are stressed. It's a very stressful environment. I think if some of you have delivered babies before it is extremely slow and in so many situations these um healthcare workers often women themselves um you know haven't been paid they're working long hours they're tired they're burnt out so again how do we improve how does the community actually help those healthcare workers how does it actually honor those healthcare workers can we have a little medal for the healthcare worker who's delivered you know x number of babies or who has worked at the healthcare facility for x number again keep a positive spin on things because the more positive it is i think that you know you can have a better outcome I see the one question there about um, faith-based facilities, often not part of the government's uh, system. But you know, there are so many uh, opportunities for those uh, organizations and those uh, faith-based uh, facilities um, to to address this. They often have uh, a little bit more of a tight leadership uh, that you know there there just seems to be maybe better communication within those um, faith-based and, um, and and nonprofits. So you know, I, I wouldn't use that as a as a reason to sort of say oh, it's harder for them. I think if anything, they've got more flexibility than even government facilities where, you know, it seems like short shortages are always just so much more acute, et cetera. So just um, encourage them to, to hold to the same standards as well too, because I really, it's, it's very possible. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Chamberlain and, um, and Suzanne for that. Um, we are coming close to the end of of our time here together um, and I would love to um, just give each of you a chance to share a, um, a closing um, thought if you have one. Um, there is another question we got. I think Suzanne you um, you touched on this um, a fair amount when you in, in your response as well um, from Bangladesh where they were asking about um, how to write a proposal with um, with co-designing with communities and midwives. Um, and maybe if there are some specific indicators to include. So if you'd like to address that as well, um, uh, if you have any ideas or thoughts, um, you can share that as well. But I'd um, love to turn it over to, uh, to the two of you to, um, if there's anything else that you, you, that popped into your mind or something you'd like to share. Um, go ahead, again. I will. I was just gonna, go first. I'm looking at one of the questions about the indicators, and I think um, again the indicators arise from the co-design process because until you understand, you know, the particular dynamics of that context of the community and the facility, um, you don't really know, you know, what are the activities that will be prioritized from the you know, from their perspective, and that will give you the the indicators. I, I just want to put a plug in for, um, there are a couple of really good curricula. One is called Health Workers for Change. It's been around for a long time, but it's very well done. And then um, if you look at Hashima, the project in Kenya, um, it has a, a very nice, uh, exercise that that they used with providers that is essentially a values clarification exercise that and they, they have a number of you know fairly and they used health workers for change also in the context of their program so 
uh, and I, I agree and that um, we also really need to start with pre-service. I've been saying this for decades. Um, unfortunately, not many donors are interested in pre-service education, but that's the place that we have to start because that's where the behavior is modeled. And that's where, um, you know, respect is engendered from the beginning. Oh, and there's one other uh, resource that I think is really interesting, um, WHO about three or four years ago published something called Midwives Voices, Midwives Realities, which was a, a, a compilation of a survey that they put out. They expected to receive a couple of hundred responses. They got close to 2000. And it's a reflection of what midwives lives are like the world over. And um, it is uh, startling to say the least. But I think reading that helps us to understand the perspective from um, the provider's standpoint as well. And thank you for your participation. Great. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Yeah, yeah, it's it been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just uh, want to uh, yeah just build on what Suzanne said there in terms of um, um, as we sort of look at the bigger issues, it's people. And it's, the, as you mentioned, it's the pre-service where the training as uh, midwives, as physicians, nurses, uh, is really, really important to, to start there. And part of the challenge I find with disrespectful care is, is donors aren't interested because donors don't necessarily see this always as a problem. And they, if they haven't been there and haven't seen it themselves, it's kind of like, well, I it probably exists every once in a while, but I think that's the challenge too, is just really uh, helping people understand because it's a very different world than what they're used to. Um, so, so that that's an issue is, is the uh, donors. Uh, but again, let, let's always remember that the disrespect is coming primarily. And I'm, again, I, I did touch on the fact that I find if facilities are not uh, uh, conducive to um, women's care, then that's a type of disrespect. The majority of the disrespect is coming from other people. And so it's really people that we need to be focused on changing behavior, but also encouraging good behavior and affirming people for the work that they're doing. Uh, so I think that's just so, so important. Um, and uh, yeah, just to encourage people to look at the Save the Mother's website. Uh, there's some more information there about the mother baby friendly hospitals and videos and that sort of thing. And, um, and yeah, t time uh, is required for this kind of change, but I think we're already starting to see the change. And thanks to people like Suzanne, who's really focused on this and really brought uh, the issue to light. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. Great. Yes. So a big, big thank you to Dr. Chamber to Suzanne and Dr. Chamberlain um, for your time today, um, preparing and sharing um, all of this with us, and to everyone who has joined um, and listened in today for your time. We look forward to continuing these conversations um, this year. We'd love to have you join us. Um, so if you registered for the webinar, you will receive um, a link to the recording in an email from CCIH. Um, if you didn't, you um, you should be able to find it on the CCIH YouTube channel um, and on their website under Resources for Women and Children's Health. Um, so we want to thank you again for joining us in our discussion. Um, and we would love, speaking of feedback mechanisms, we would love um, for you to let us know what you thought of it um, and help us to improve. Um, so there is... Um, uh, there are four questions um, in a survey. You should be seeing the link on your screen um, that you can just go and answer for us real quick so that we know what worked and what we can work on a bit. Um, it's bit.ly slash CCIH webinar review. Um, and I think you'll get that link in the email if you register beforehand as well. So with that, and we've gone a few minutes over, thank you for your time um, and we will uh, look forward to connecting with all of you soon. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much.